ready? Ready to go? Okay, I'm on. All right, welcome. Today is the Picking County Board of County Commissioners regular meeting. Today is Wednesday, January 24th, 2018. Before I do additions and deletions, we are going to do a proclamation recognizing School Choice Week 2018. And I'm just gonna read it from here since there's no one here to accept the proclamation. So this is a proclamation of the Board of County Commissioners. Whereas all children in Picking County should have access to the highest quality education possible and whereas Pitkin County recognizes the important role that an effective education plays in preparing all students in Pitkin County to be successful adults and whereas quality education is critically important to the economic vitality of Pitkin County and whereas Pitkin County is home to a multitude of high quality public and non-public schools from which parents can choose for their children, in addition to families who educate the chil their children in the home. And whereas educational variety not only helps to diversify our economy, but also enhances the vibrancy of our community. And whereas Picking County has many high quality teaching professionals in all types of school settings who are committed to educating our children. And whereas School Choice Week is celebrated across the country by millions of students, parents, educators, schools, and organizations to raise awareness of the need for effective educational options. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the Picking County Board of County Commissioners recognizes January 21st through 27th, 2018 as Picking County School Choice Week. Thank you, and I don't know where we will this will land, but we will find a place. All right, now I'm going to go on to any additions and deletions to the agenda. Yes, I have uh, three items for the board today. Um, two will require action by the board to add to the agenda. Uh, the first would be in addition to the end of the consent items. It is a resolution of the Board of County Commissioners of Picking County, Colorado designating the official agenda posting place for the calendar year 2018. You should have a copy of that resolution uh, in front of you. Uh, just for the public, uh, the proposed posting, posting place until our new uh, administration and sheriff office building is complete is the lobby of the old courthouse. Um, typically, this is something we do at the beginning of the year. We, we had missed that during our first regular meeting, so we're adding that today to designate that. The second item um, that will require formal action by the board to add is an emergency ordinance of the Board of County Commissioners of Picking County, <clears throat> uh, Colorado, authorizing the purchase of the Phillips Trailer Park. Um, we are proposing that Local that... Park. Mobile, <laughs> I'm sorry, mobile home park. I was reading off it of the- It says trailer uh, park. <laughs> I don't mind calling uh, them trailer parks. I live in one. Okay. Um, we would propose adding that as um, probably a, a new item 12 or 11A under emergency ordinances. So that would come after your individual consideration items, second reading. You should also have an AIS and that proposed emergency ordinance in front of you. So that is one, two, and three. And number three does not require uh, action. It will be a presentation during public comments um, from oh. CORE. And so just to note that we will have that coming up. And, and are we waiting for Nope, we're, nope, everyone's here. Not coming? Yep. Okay, <laughs> I, thought, I thought we were expecting Mona. So that one does not require action. I just okay. wanted to inform okay. the board. So now I will um, open it up to public comments. Please uh, limit your comments to about three minutes and introduce yourself. So anyone wishing to comment? Do we need to vote on? Second. You'll need a oh, wait, I need, before we do that, I need a, thank you. I need a motion and a second to amend the agenda. I'll move to add those two <laughs> items to the agenda. Second. Um, any other comments? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you, John, for reminding me. Now, sorry. Marty. GR. Had to throw me a wild card there. We go right over commissioner comments and everything? 
Uh, comes after public comment. Okay. This oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you were public comment. Yeah. I see <laughs> GR here. Something official. Yeah. They're just I, trying to confuse me. <laughs> right. Okay. I did get one of those. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Marty Treadway. I'm the program director for CORE and um, the Community Office for Resource Efficiency. And I'm here on behalf of our executive director, Mona Newton, who couldn't make it today uh, to present a uh, payment on a grant that the county is receiving for a uh, solar system at the Public Works building. So I just wanted to um, present this check to, to GR Fielding. He'll probably say a few words here. Um, but this uh, <laughs> project is is uh, sort of the brainchild of, you know, uh, GR's <laughs> department and um, trying to get uh, county buildings to net zero on the electric side is a laudable goal and something we really wanted to give a shout out to the county for pursuing and supporting. Um, it's something that CORE is um, very interested in seeing light a fire for other projects to follow suit. So we're hoping this, this action by the county really demonstrates okay. what can be done locally, um, even in the city of Aspen and the Upper Valley here, to produce your own power on site and offset all of your electric use. So we congratulate GR for the effort and the, and the county as well. Thanks, Marty. Uh, I just wanted to update the board a little bit on on how that project is producing uh, it's a hundred and four and a half kilowatt array it consists of 303 panels uh, so far it is offset 80,000 pounds of carbon dioxide which would be the equivalent of planting about 2,000 trees um, the uh, it, it's it has uh, it has basically zeroed out our, our electric usage there at Public Works. Uh, I believe in two, uh, that project was the largest solar array uh, installed with uh, any sort of grant uh, from CORE. Uh, and uh, the exciting thing about that is for 2018, it wouldn't even make the podium. Uh, so uh, <laughs> if I remember correctly from your grant uh, submittals this right. year and, and what was awarded that, yeah, uh, <laughs> there was three projects uh, for 2018 lined out that would be bigger. Wow, that's great. So, In the Upper absolutely. Valley? Absolutely. Yes. That's and great. Old Snowmass, but. We'll count that up again. Yeah. So, George. Yeah, just to piggyback off of those comments, uh, you know, this past year, CORE gave out over $700,000 in grants to 28 local organizations. Uh, for commercial energy efficiency projects as well as renewable energy projects and and the county is, is just one part of that uh, It anticipates that through all these grants that these organiza organizations are utilizing uh, will offset over two million pounds of co2 emissions which is uh, a huge step in terms of uh, protecting our environment and certainly it helps our economy and uh, I think it's the right direction for the county to continue to go in. So, so thank you for CORE. Thank you, George. So, GR, you, you do know that check is made out to Pitkin County. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I saw your eyes light up when you were looking at the number. <laughs> well, as Marty Sorry. knows, it, we've been going back and forth and uh, making sure that all of our bureaucracies are, are checked off before, uh, <laughs> before it was issued and everything. So it's been a, a long time coming. Thank you okay. for your patience. Yes. Any, any other members of the board wishing to comment on this? Yeah, Greg. Uh, I'm just in light of today's news with the, the national news about the, uh, the, 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 the tariffs put on solar panels. Um, Marty, could you just give us a little update? What's your perspective on that? <laughs> uh, sure. I, I think you know, it kind of remains to be seen what the larger impacts of this are going to be, obviously. But I, I, you know, for me, I think there's a large sense, at least in my circles, I know I'm a little biased working for, for CORE, that the, the ship has sailed a bit on renewable energy at, at large, and especially PV. It's already so cheap and so ubiquitous and becoming the norm that I'm hoping this won't have a dramatic impact on the short-term market. I feel like a lot of projects are underway. Um, this 30% tariff uh, on imported panels, uh, I think the intention is to make us more competitive in the solar market, and hopefully that happens with um, American-made panels. So we'll see what happens. Meanwhile, I hope CORE stockpiled a few. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know SunSense did. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thanks. And the, ca the county will be going to RFP for our next solar project here very soon, so we're going to have a pretty good sense of what that short term is uh, impact to the county itself. Yeah. Great. Any other comments? 
Thank you. Thank you for bringing it forward in, in a public meeting. We really appreciate that. Thank you. It's good a pleasure. Job. Good job. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Well done. Those numbers are exciting. Now for commissioner comments. Any members of the board? I, I, can, ahead, well, I can just I'll follow up on the solar uh, under, with the encouragement over the years from CORE and others. I, I put solar panels on my the roof of my garage this fall. And uh, okay. I'm, we now have uh, the, the, the Solar Way, which is my street power company, informally <laughs> producing power. But I don't think we're net zero yet, to my chagrin. We'll keep working on that. Well, good for you. Good, to, good change. Rachel. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, this is a, a little bit awkward. I'm not fully prepared. Um, I wasn't aware of the potential double meanings in a school choice proclamation. And so I really just want to put a footnote out there. Uh, school choice has kind of blurred the line among, you know, uh, districts being able to have charter schools that uh, really perform and uh, charter schools that are private charter schools that may very well siphon off the public funding and dollars for uh, education. And I, so I just really want to add a footnote to the comment. Um, they're reporting that close to 200 to between 200 and 300 charter schools close every year. And that takes a lot of money out of public schools. Now we have charter schools here, such as in Woody Creek in the community school, and it's uh, well attended and well supervised. But there's a great many um, charter schools that don't perform that way and literally are a way for people to shunt children away from the main school, uh, problem children or, or those with low academic attendance. Um, there are stories in the paper about literally closed grocery stores with cubicles where students have no actual teachers and watch videotapes and the performance standards can be pretty low. And so while I am an advocate for uh, greater education and investments in education, uh, I do become very concerned about the idea of my taxpayer dollars perhaps going to a religious institution or uh, homeschooling uh, opportunities that are using textbooks that, you know, all you have to do is look online and read some of this that really blur the distinctions in our history and our constitution and are politically motivated. So uh, I just wanted to put a footnote out there that the term school choice and the school choice movement uh, is celebrated by public educators and everyone alike, as it should be, but uh, it's such a um, um, kind of amoeba-like word mm -hmm. that it means different things to different people. And I just want to go on the record that I, I am not for uh, vouchers for some students selected and others discriminated against uh, that uh, undermines our public education. So I'll just leave it at that. Thanks, Rachel. I'm just going to add to that. In reading this, I just want to note that also included our preschools, and there's a big move across the country to uh, try and have adequate preschool opportunities for children. And um, I'm a little biased because my daughter is a preschool mm -hmm. director, and she is the teacher responsible for preparing kids to move on to kindergarten. And um, she does an amazing job, and these kids are well prepared to move into the whatever school system they choose from preschool on. So, um, yeah, the education system in this country, although many feel is is failing, um, lagging behind other countries. Um, you know, I think we do a pretty darn good job around here, and I'm proud of the students that graduate and go on. Yeah. Yeah, and again, I apologize. For some reason, I had it on my agenda, but not the actual resolution in my Yeah, packet. that's why I got a copy of it. Yeah, okay, uh, thank brought you. Brought forward for us. Any other commissioner comments? Okay, seeing then, we will move on. Oh, I want to just announce the X Games starts a week from today. The uh, X Games starts tomorrow. I mean, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> a week from last It will be week. over a week from today. It starts a week from tomorrow. Gosh, the time is flying. Mm -hmm. um, at Buttermilk, tomorrow. they are geared up and ready to go. Um, so please get out there, enjoy the festivities. Remember, it is a car free um, event, so you need to take a bus. Um, and please do not walk on the highway. That's why the bus system has been bumped up for this event. Um, it is an amazing event, as we all know, and hopefully we'll have snow because then the cameras make it look really good around the country and around the world. So let's, um, let's wish everybody well out there and stay safe. Very good. Okay, bringing it back to our regular agenda. We have our consent items, single reading. First um, item on our agenda is the minutes of a regular meeting on January the 10th, 2018. Second item is a resolution approving and adopting Colorado's statewide investment pool indenture of trust 
Tom, that heading sounds so spooky, indenture of trust. We have a resolution appointing citizen board member, and we have the resolution designating the official agenda posting place for the calendar year for 2018. I'll move all of those agendas forward. Second. I have a motion and a second. Comment, Steve. Um, I have one change on the minutes and a question about the appointing citizen board members. Okay. On the minutes, uh, it, it says on the first page that Commissioner Patty Clapper took the chair's seat for 2018, but in fact it was on page two after we did the resolution appointing the chair and vice chair that you became the it was a couple paragraphs we just need to became, shift it. and I don't know if it matters, but if someone in the future reads it, they might say, well, Patty's didn't, you know, we, we messed it up because she was there yet. became the chair okay. before we actually voted on it. So I would move to amend the minutes to put that one sentence after the resolution appointing the chair and vice chair. Yeah, we don't need a motion, Janet. We'll just correct that. Okay. In a minute. Thank and you. then your, your second one was on the appointment. On the uh, citizen board members, um, the, the person who had applied for the APSHA board um, position, the city council was supposed to look at that yesterday, and do we know if they did? actually uh, vote on that or anything uh we we do i do not know now charlotte may have uh, um, had an opportunity to check in so we do not know the status right okay now. and this board wanted it to come back to us with his resume before we made a decision so um i know jeanette has the, the resume if we want to look at it we can make a decision at our next work session or we could do it after tonight at the end of our meeting right if people had a chance to look at the resume We'll, we'll decide at the end for open discussion. All right, any other changes? Nope, no corrections, no comments. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes 5-0. Thank you, Jeanette. Next item on the individual consent items, first reading and set for public hearings on February the 14th. We have an ordinance adopting the Picking County Code Title VI, Chapter 6.29, Picking County Gray Water Treatment System Regulations. And Kurt Dahl, would you please introduce yourself to the public? Okay. Thank you. Kurt Dahl, Picking County Environmental Health Manager. Um, so one question for you, Patty, before we start. I know as the Board of Health, um, I've done this presentation a couple of times to this entire group, um, so I wasn't sure how formal I need to be with this initial presentation. I have slides, and I can go through the whole piece. Um, Let me ask the board. Does the board, because since we've already seen this when sitting as the Board of Health, do we want to review it again now? Or if we have any questions from the public, we can do it at second reading. Is that okay? I'm comfortable with not having the presentation again because we looked at it in work session and then as the Board of Health and, and there are no changes from what the Board of Health looked at. Correct? correct. The only change was we changed the title from Board of Health throughout the proposed regulation to Board of County Commissioners. Other than that, there are no changes. Great. Thank you for asking, Kurt. I really appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. I agree with Steve. Yeah. So if we can move forward, then we need a motion. And a I, second to move I would move to approve the ordinance adopting Picken County's Code Title VI, Chapter 6.29, Picken County Gray Wall Treatment System Regulations. I'll second. And we will set this for a public hearing on February the 14th. Any comments? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes 5 0. Thanks, Kurt. And yeah, the next item yep. is Kurt again. This is uh, repealing and replacing our environmental health um, fees with the new fee schedule. Correct. Um, this is again in relation to the gray water regulation, just adding a fee for the gray water system permits. The county recommendation or the star, sorry, the uh, environmental health department recommendation was to charge on the hourly fee. The reason behind that is, uh, one, there are no requirements in state statute, uh, like the septic system permitting fees. So we can charge what we would like. Um, the reasoning behind doing an hourly fee is there is likely going to be some overlap for a few of the permits that come in that will have septic systems as well. 
and the information overlap there, we'll gain some efficiencies. So it's, it doesn't seem reasonable to straight out charge somebody a flat fee when the review time for a gray water system and a septic system both, it, that gray water portion is going to be less or, or septic system portion is going to be less, but we can't change the septic permit fee. So we felt the most fair way to approach this was to do an hourly charge based on the amount of review time and then any type of inspection time. Are there any comments or questions? Go ahead, Steve. Uh, Kurt, is there a possibility that the first one or two people coming through making an application for a gray water system will be charged more because it might take you longer to review their, their proposal? And is there any way we could um, rectify that for the, to make it fair for the first couple people? Good, that's a good point. Um, Likely, um, just getting through the the process the first time, there may be some additional time. Um, you know, I'm certainly open to any ideas of trying to minim or you know, not overcharge them for something as we're trying to learn through the process. I don't know if that means we would just, you know, try to be as fair as we could with how many hours we're spending or half hour or portion thereof on that piece. But certainly we can think about that so that if it is something where we're hours and hours into a review, which is not where we are with like a, a septic permit review, um, then we would probably call that if that's agreeable with, with the board in terms of the first couple as we work through that process. Yeah. That's a great point, Steve, and I appreciate you taking into consideration. It seems that, you know, it's kind of like putting together a bicycle for the first time on Christmas Eve or something. It would take a lot longer than the second or third bicycle. And, you know, just to maybe chalk those hours up to, you know, staff education and training. Mm -hmm. um, not that the first ones are free, but that, you know. So I, I appreciate your consideration of that. Okay. Any other comments? Just wondering if there if there a minimum charge would be considered a minimum or a maximum. I guess the maximum could be sky's the limit. That's pretty tough. Right. Um, you know we haven't considered a maximum, although uh, you know again I wouldn't expect this review to be anything more than what we're doing with our septic system permits right now in terms of time. Um, so the uh, minimum review, the, the policy we have is we typically try to charge by quarter hour, so 15-minute increments. So, you know, if it took us 15 minutes to do something, that would probably be the minimum charge we would have. Got it. Um, okay. I don't foresee that, at least for the, you know, first couple. That's, you know, we don't get a review of anything completed within 15 minutes, but mm -hmm. that's how we handle that. It sounds like they'll be, it'll be easy enough to estimate what the cost will be. If somebody comes and asks, you'll have an idea on an estimate at right. least it, right and that'll be refined as time goes on correct yeah and we we always reevaluate these fees so we can reevaluate in a year and see if we if we even have anybody who's coming in and and how much time it took and what it would take and and how we want to address it in the future yeah yeah, yeah rachel yeah i i fully agree with this because you know we may think of kind of a s standard home or 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 something but a lot of these can be the 10,000 12,000 square foot residences on very difficult properties that may have six bathrooms or ten bathrooms and uh, you know I, I, the work is is complicated and so I want to make sure uh, we've always said growth and development will pay its own way and so again uh, when someone has something relatively straightforward that's that's one thing but when you talk about these mechanical systems on uh, shorter lots or difficult uh, per perk on the ground on the soils it, it can take a lot of time so I, I think that this is appropriate great I have a motion. I'll move to approve a resolution repealing and reenacting environmental health department fees. Second. I have a motion. I have a second. Any further comments, questions? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes 5 0. Thank you, Kurt. Oh, thank you. And we'll see you on Valentine's Day. <laughs> well, I won't, they will. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we have a resolution authorizing approval of a cable franchise agreement with Comcast. With Comcast, I looked at the one below it. It says Comcast with Comcast of Colorado. Please introduce yourself for the public. Hello, Kara Silbernagel with uh, the manager's office. Before you today is an agreement for a com for a cable franchise agreement with Comcast. Um, we discussed it a little bit yesterday during work session, but this is a 10-year agreement. Our prior agreement 
expired on December 31st, 2016, and we've been operating basically on a month-to-month -month basis until Comcast and Pickin County could come to an agreement for a renewal. As part of this project, we have done a joint um, agreement negotiations with City of Aspen, uh, Town of Snemas Village, as well as Town of Basalt, with so that we all will have similar peg fees. Public Education and Government <laughs> Access Channel is what PEG stands for. Um, <laughs> so similar PEG fees and franchise fees for all of the jurisdictions within Pitkin County. Yes, Rachel. Well, uh, just for a little more detail for those who didn't catch our exciting work session yesterday, um, who have you worked with, has Pitkin County worked with to develop this contract, and why is it superior than just letting the old franchise yes. agreement run? Thank you. Um, so Pitkin County and the three other jurisdictions engaged with uh, Ken Fellman from Kissinger and Fellman, and they are kind of the telecommunications expert in the state, and given their expertise within specifically even cable franchises we thought that they would be helpful in these negotiations as well as last year Pickin County became a member of the Colorado Communications Utility Alliance which through that statewide organization um, has come up with a model uh, franchise agreement that Comcast has agreed to and so a lot of the negotiation terms not to get too technical but a lot of those negotiation terms from everything from record access to um, you know, competitive equity and prices have all already been agreed upon, so it gave us a starting point of where we could begin. So really the main discussion point for us um, came down to the PEG channels as it really relates to this valley um, because that franchise agreement was born out of Denver and Aurora, so whatever. Comcast agreed to with those big entities, hopefully they would agree to with us as well. Um, and so from that, what we've gotten is an increase or an increase in our PEG stations. So um, in the future, you will see grassroots as well as CGTV in both standard definition and high definition. Um, one will come on live this summer and then the next one will be delayed for two years and will come on. And as part of that delay, then the four entities have also received a grant from Comcast to help support on-demand um, uh, access of these PEG channels um, on the internet. So the two biggest wins that we got from Comcast was really getting two additional stations for HD, so you'll find those up in the HD numbers on your scrolling screen, um, as well as a grant to support on-demand uh, internet access of those PEG stations as well. And, and I, just to clear you for, even further, it's my understanding that because we were renewing or reauthorizing or redoing this contract, um, we were also able to bring in other fees that, that go into the percentage of, of what Comcast reimburses the county, things that we were now allowed to, to include in that number, correct? Correct. Um, as the, uh, I guess, the state of the authority of local governments in these franchise <laughs> agreements has kind of dwindled over the years from the original act, you know, it's even more imperative that you start to find what those what is still available to local governments for access of the right of way. And so while internet and phone are not part of franchise agreements, even though they are part of maybe a package with Comcast, only video services, but it's things related to video services. So perhaps it's not only what you might pay, but what they're getting in advertising fees or other things that are related to those video services. And rather than just the cable service, it could be the box or other other pieces that we weren't actually including in that, that number. So now we're able to. And yet we are limited a lot by some legislative issues at the state level that have really restricted. And I think that happened in the 90s. So we're having to be a little more creative. And I think we're going to have to be even more creative in the future as these services change with technology. So exactly. thank you, Kara. Is there any other questions or comments from the board? I, yeah, I'd right. just love to, Kara, I want to ask you about the organization you mentioned the, the, uh, the cable users or you yes. have to repeat what that what that one's called mm -hmm. but I'm wondering are, are are they looking forward to the time when these cable franchise agreements are really finished and the cable funding that the communities receive is gone 
are they looking toward renegotiating or it's, it's a legislative issue I understand um, to to try to maybe recreate something that was taken away in the late 90s yeah. regarding the fee structure so the organization is the Colorado Communications Utilities Alliance um, and it actually started out as basically a front range consortium of all the different public um, government uh, stations so Aurora has their own station Denver has their own station so that's how they really got together in the first place was really when these peg stations became more popular in government stations um, and just through the years as that um, what that service has expanded into maybe even broadband services as well um, it's definitely something on the top of their minds you know at the conference that they held last fall I don't know if they to your point Greg are able to answer that question as far as what's next but they're definitely having that discussion is what happens when franchise agreements are no part are no longer applicable to local government and to these government access channels um, they're not really sure what that looks like but really see that that is coming down the pipeline very soon as we all transition to more of these internet services and as um Ken had mentioned yesterday there are these over-the-top services so a lot of people are getting their TV service from um, Hulu or Netflix and those are not subject to franchise agreements because you have to own the infrastructure and provide the channels and most of these we're seeing you might be an internet provider and then separately are providing the channels over the internet right the, uh, the easements will still continue of course mm -hmm. but the ability of local governments to franchise given the really um, restricted definition of franchise agreements it will start to even diminish even more so more to come I'm sure that will be a topic as this moves forward thank you for yeah. that no, Rachel. yeah just um, by way of background uh, the telecom and and internet companies are <coughs> extremely powerful influence in Washington DC and the state of Colorado and while we tried to get a bill through last year that would address some deficiencies in a law that's over 10 years old, uh, it very quickly became a industry bill and we had to see it killed by its own sponsor. And I think we may see similar <laughs> type of challenges this year. So it's almost more about hmm. them trying to restrict local municipalities, governments, right. and communities more than trying to empower them. And Makara has been right there on the front line with others helping fight that battle. Um, I think if we weren't seeing that sort of influence, we wouldn't see the net neutrality uh, changes at the FCC at the federal level either. And so while I'd be happy, I think we should continue to work on this, uh, there seems to be a little, well, tough luck uh, local governments trying to bring broadband to your people. Just wait for the market to take care of it. And uh, um, so we're we're struggling. Uh, you know, it's kind of, uh, it's going to be hard to see real movement in this area. So. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Kara, thank you. Um, do I have a motion? I'll move to approve the resolution authorizing approval of a cable franchise agreement with Comcast of Colorado. And this is set for public reading and on the 14th. Mm -hmm. And the second I'll from second. Rachel. Thank you. Um, any further? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you very much. Motion passes 5 0. Thanks, Kara. Next, we have an individual consideration item, public hearing one reading. This is an application for a special events liquor permit submitted by Compass for Lifelong Discovery Aspen Community School. Thank you, and please give your names for the public Thank record. Thank you. Jeanette Jones, clerk to the board. And I have with me today Jennifer Butler. And Patty, you pretty much said what I was <laughs> going to say. Um, the event is at the Cozy Point Ranch, and it's their annual fundraising event for the Aspen Community School, and it's going to be held on February 17th. And I will let Jennifer give you an overview of their event. Perfect. Please. Hi there. Uh, my name is Jennifer Butler, and I'm the president, uh, vice president of the board of um, Compass, and we are the nonprofit that oversees both the Aspen and the Carbondale Community Schools. And this is the third time that I've been in front of you <laughs> asking for your support for our event. Um, th this is a local event that's family friendly, so we have 
um, younger kids all the way up to people in their 80s enjoying the event together. <laughs> and um, the thing that's nice about it is it, it encompasses people from Rifle all the way to Aspen, and it also draws on some money from um, our out-of-town guests as well. We do market to the hotels to get um, people from out of town to come to our event as well, so we're not just soliciting money from our own communities, but from other communities that are here to, to visit the area. And um, I am seeking a, we have all of our paperwork in for the special event permit, and I am seeking the liquor portion of our event. We do have a uh, roped off area where um, we do serve alcoholic beverages by a tip certified bartender throughout the entirety of the event. Well, you've learned how to work all the answers into your comments. <laughs> and we would like tip you to certified. use this opportunity to um, explain to the public the cost and how to get tickets. And sure. So um, you can go to our website, which is www.familyhoedown.org, and you can purchase tickets to the event, um, as well as raffle tickets at the event. It takes place, as Jeanette said, on the 17th of February, uh, which is President's Weekend. And um, the event runs from 3 o'clock till 7 p.m., Adults are $25 tickets. Children um, under 3 are free, and from 3 to 12 are $15, and that includes the price of admission, all children's activities, um, and a catered dinner by smoke. And um, it has been wildly successful in the past. This is our main fundraiser for both of our schools, and last year we raised about $80,000, which was $40,000 for each school. Wow. wow. So. so, and you have activities from dancing to pony rides to Aspen Tree Experience, face painting, roping steers, arts and crafts, archery, um, and bounce houses. You have two bounce houses, and you have a dessert table. We do have a dessert table. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we have some new um, activities also this year geared kind of towards the older kids. We have a lesson in physics with our trebuchet, and we also have um, an older kids obstacle course bounce house. So we're Fun. trying to, yes, we, we are looking at our, our demographics of the attendees each year and kind of tailoring our activities to, to those groups. And parking is there behind the facility where the there's parking park. there behind the facility and then also we run a school bus from the um, intercept lot Perfect. to cozy point um, which we use a school bus and a school bus driver for that we transportation would appreciate people service then using that parking yeah and yeah. Park, yeah bus bus pulling yeah so that's a free shuttle that runs from the intercept lot to the ranch great to know and it's heated it's a it's it's a heated indoor riding arena so you won't be cold <laughs> Yes, great. I'm, I attended that with my family last year. We had a blast. It was oh, great. good. Really enjoyed it. I'm um, glad. I wanted to ask you about uh, composting, uh, compostable plates and forks, and you know, what's the what's the litter footprint or the the, the, the litter footprint, footprint is that we work through Cozy Point. That part of our agreement with them and the fee that we pay with them um, takes care of our trash services. And this year we are doing, which we haven't in the past, doing recyclable. Um, doing recyclable uh, containers because we're going to be serving um, a, we've gotten Coca-Cola to sponsor with a, a, a canned juice drink for the event. So we will be having recycling Great. containers for those um, items. But we, at this point, do not have a compostable situation. Okay, something to look forward to. Yeah, that, yeah that'll be a new one for next year. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Steve. Um, along that same line that brought up something in my mind that given that plastic is kind of on the way out on being a good thing for us to be using and it's I'm sure it's probably too late for this year but for future years if you could minimize the amount of plastic containers that you have for for anything definitely I think that's going to become an up-and-coming thing to start using more compostable containers, no containers at all, or aluminum or glass containers, so so we don't have so much plastic that we have to deal with at the landfill and going into the oceans and that sort of thing. Duly noted. And at the community schools, whenever we have a potluck, we um, we encourage our families to bring their own silverware and their own plates. So we'll try to carry that <laughs> on to the <laughs> to the hoedown. 
Well, and for your information, um, it's great. And, you know, next year you can work with um, Kathy Hall out at the Picking County Solid Waste Center, and she can help you kick in some compostable ideas and thoughts and, and, and help you with that. And it's going to be the trend, and, and it would be great to see you guys leading the way. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we do. Educating all those families and children. Exactly, exactly. And we do have a compostable program at our school, too, so it would be nice to piggyback on Perfect. that. Um, great. So thank you. Any other questions, comments? Do Come I have up. a motion? I'll move to approve the application for a special events liquor permit <coughs> submitted by Compass for Lifelong Discovery. Second. I have a motion and I have a second, and we are very happy to be doing this for you and for <coughs> everyone like that, that you know, benefits from this great, great opportunity. So all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes 5-0. Nice to see you. Thank you. As You're always, welcome. Jeanette, I'll, I'll pass you. these on to you. These oh. are the posting of the oh. permit. Awesome. Excellent. Thank Thanks you all very Thanks much. Thanks for coming. I hope you all come this year. <laughs> hope to see you again. All right. Next, we have individual consideration items, public hearings. These are second readings. The first item is an ordinance authorizing an agricultural lease of Emma, o Emma Open Space North Lease Area. Please introduce yourself for the public. Thanks, Patty. I'm Paul Holsinger, the agricultural uh, agriculture and Conservation Easement Administrator for Picking County Open Space and Trails. And uh, I'll pull up a map here to help guide the... Uh, he came in early to make sure he was still in here, so he was organized to give us maps, which we <laughs> appreciate greatly. That is right. Maps. So this is the Emma Open Space. Um, and uh, we just completed a management plan for this property last year. And uh, part of uh, the one of the action items out of that management plan was to continue leasing um, areas of the property that we had previously been leasing. And so uh, this, uh, the 20 acre, which is just to the left of the pointer, is the, pro is the piece that we're talking about right now. So the property was actually divided into three separate lease leasable areas. Um, and uh, so with that management plan, we went ahead and we put these lease areas out to bid. Uh, we put it out uh, back in September uh, to the public. We advertised it on the newspaper and on social media and our website and uh, kept it open until mid-November. And uh, for this particular piece, we got two applications, uh, one from Billy Grange, who is the neighbor to the uh, east there, and uh, who ultimately uh, was recommended to obtain the lease by our selection committee. And uh, um, he put in a bid for uh, continuing to irrigate the property for hay and, and uh, cattle grazing in the fall. Uh, his bid was uh, $7.50 an acre, annual lease rate. And the selection committee felt that was uh, an acceptable lease rate, so brought it to the Open Space and Trails Board, and they have also recommended that uh, Grange Family Ranches obtain this 20-acre lease for a lease term of five years at that $7.50 an acre for 20 acres, so $150 annually. So... So, uh, yeah, George. <clears throat> it should be noted, I guess, that um, the Grange family has leased this parcel for over the last half dozen years and mm -hmm. has done a good job in terms of uh, maintaining it and, and addressing the, the goals for the Open Space and Trails program. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Even before we had goals <laughs> set for that property, they, <laughs> they were, were already there. furthering the goals that we came up with. So. I have a question, kind of an in general. So we're finding, since you know, we're really moving this, this agricultural leasing program along with Open Space, which I think is amazing, and I thank you for all your efforts, um, that when we have a leaseholder who is in good stead and who's really done a great job, um, sometimes we will roll the lease over. Do we ever do that or give them an extended period of time, or does everybody have to come back through the process every... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> The, the way that we've uh, structured the process is we have an agricultural lease policy that guides our, uh, our advertising and uh, our selection and, and uh, the whole process. And within that process, there's a, a set of selection criteria. 
and uh, within the criteria, there is a uh, a um, a question for the selection committee that if this person has been leasing this property uh, in the past and they are still in good standing, uh, that selection committee can uh, elevate them in the, um, in the ranking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, which I, you know, because we have more and more, we're seeing the investment that these leaseholders are putting in, um, the, the the toil. I mean, we have, mm -hmm. I mean, they really the work, the sweat equity is huge. I mean, maintaining the water rights and the weed management and just enhancing the soil, um, those are huge things. And and you know, if you're talking a heritage apple farm, you know, apple orchard. It takes a while to see the return on that. So I think that's really wise of us to, to really incentivize people to continue to, to really, you know, do the work on the land because it really is a benefit to everyone in this community and, you know, to Picking County and to the people who get to share and the, you know, reap the crops that come off of these mm -hmm. and the horses that get to eat the, the hay and pasture sure. on the land. So I, th I think it's a great program, and I really appreciate it. Any other comments from the board? Steve? Mm, question for Paul. Um, could you explain on the the aerial photograph the north lease area is a much darker green, but there are areas of it that are lighter colored green versus the other two 11 acre parcels over here that are much lighter green. Sure. Is that a reflection of the irrigation system or that something's been harvested or grazed on the land or do you know? Hey. Well, I don't know, but I would suspect that it's a little bit of both of what you said. So this 20-acre piece, uh, just right over here, is uh, it's flood irrigated. And what I suspect is that this property uh, had not been hayed, whereas this property, it's hard to see my pointer, <laughs> the 11-acre piece uh, on the far left here, this was actually in potato production when this aerial photograph was taken, and so they had probably gone through and, and harvested. This piece over here, uh, it has a little bit of a different irrigation system, and I think it was also hayed. You can kind of see that there were lines, so uh, I think it was a combination of uh, that piece was flood irrigated, it hadn't been hayed, and I think uh, Billy at the time was probably about to put some head out there yeah and the reason I bring this up I I was suspecting it was just the timing of when the photograph was taken and what had been harvested or not but it it could reflect on how well the DC had been taking care of the property sure. since one family had the north area and the others had the the other area and I, I didn't want to have it be construed that the Grange family was taking better care of theirs because it's a darker green. <laughs> Although maybe maybe there's something to that, but I, that's yeah. why I was asking. I just wanted to verify that it was maybe the other fields have been harvested or something. Yeah. And that north field hadn't been harvested yet. Yeah. No, I think that's absolutely correct. There's and I'm not going to ask you why that one area is pink, so don't worry about coming up with an answer. <laughs> yeah. Apples. Oh, that's apples, that's right. Maybe. And the water on the other side. Any other comments? Do I have a motion? I make a motion to approve uh, the agricultural lease of the M Opus Base North Lease area between the Board of County Commissioners and the Grange Family Ranches. I have a second. And this is a public hearing. Are there any members of the public wishing to comment on this item? Seeing none, I'm going to leave the public hearing open until the end of this section. So I will call the question. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes 5-0. Thank you. Thanks. And don't go anywhere. I know. I'm here. I thought I was going to forget. Yeah, it's not going <laughs> far. I saw it. <laughs> so uh, you can jump right in. So we have another ordinance before you for another agricultural lease. Uh, this one is a little different. It uh, um, This is over the Coke Ovens open space. And uh, Coke Ovens open space is located just across uh, Highway 133 from Redstone. Uh, and if you look down by the north arrow on this map, that's uh, right where the Crystal River and where the country store is for Redstone. The Redstone Bridge is is just below that uh, and this piece we purchased a couple years ago 
Uh, we call it Coke Ovens Open Space, located behind those historic Coke Ovens that run along 133 there. Um, we've actually purchased uh, another 35 acres or gained a fee interest in the 35 acres just to the northwest as well. So altogether, Coke Ovens Open Space is 70 acres. Um, and when we first bought the property, uh, we saw that there was some... Uh, there's some irrigated meadows, there's some structures, there's some horse tax sheds and, and that kind of thing. And uh, the Open Space and Trails Board was uh, uh, took a staff recommendation that we seek out a, a lessee for that property while uh, in their interim, as an interim management step until we got to completing a management plan for the property. And so we, we did that. We uh, went out and uh, opened up a public process to get that bid um, bid in. Uh, through that process, we accepted a bid from and the Open, Open Space and Trails Board and the BOCC accepted a, a, less, a lessee, um, the Avalanche uh, Outfitters. And um, we originally intended that this property would go out to get, get programmed this year uh, because of some priorities and a lot, a lot going on. At Open Space, we had to move this uh, to out a couple years. So uh, right now, we're asking for an extension for these folks to get us to the original intent um, of the length of the lease so that they can continue to manage the property uh, while we uh, wait till probably next year or the year after to complete the management plan. And then we'll put it back out once we find out what the public wants to see on this property. And so uh, we're asking for uh, um, a new lease for them to get them to, I believe, 2020 um, at the uh, original lease rate uh, of $3,600, $3,600 annually. Um, and uh, I can take any, any questions. Any for questions? You. George. So, Paul, when you say uh, manage this, um, perhaps not similar to what we just passed, the lease, lease with the Grange family, who's going to be uh, raising hay and, and using that as a crop, what, what sort of management will um, uh, Avalanche Outfitters be doing on this property? Yeah, the, um, the management that they will be doing is, uh, if you look at the, the map here, there's an enclosed uh, fenced in area that white line is a fence so all this area is is irrigated it can be irrigated so uh, they'll be obligated to irrigate that pasture uh, they'll also be uh, obligated to control noxious weeds uh, and maintain there's several structures on the property as well uh, so there's some uh, an old, old historic mining cabin that they use in an office and uh, a tax shed they'll, they'll have to maintain those structures as well so they'll be taking care of that. Uh, they also, um, I believe they, they are the ones who plow the driveway there as well since they use it. So folks can come in and go on trail rides. And um, and this is a little different. It's not a, a agricultural lease per se. We call it a, an outfitter, an agricultural lease. So uh, they still have the same obligations as an agricultural lessee, um, but their product is different. <laughs> Great, thank you. Steve. Is any of the part up the valley from where, what they are leasing irrigated at this time? And if so, if it is irrigated, do we have a, one of the OST staff people do it, or do these people do it, or what? There's a, there are some smaller pastures that you can kind of see. Uh, Tucked in there? Yeah, I can't see the cursor. There it is, um, right at the top of the property there. Um, and uh, there's a small pasture up up here. Um, yeah, we're uh, uh, this year we're going to look at some ditch improvements because right now the property's at a bit of an angle. And so uh, nobody's actively irrigated that pasture, though we can. Uh, it kind of irrigates itself just because of the shape of the ditch. Uh, the shape that the ditch is in, it's got a lot of cutouts leaking. that... Yeah, it does flood it's irrigation leaking. on its own. It, it's flood irrigating itself right now. So we'll be looking at that with the NRCS and figuring out a, a plan. 
but we don't want to get too far down the road because we, like I said, we want to finish the management plan before we do too much on the property. Yeah, I think in over the long term, when, once the management plan is in place, that whoever is leasing the lower part should be the ones responsible for irrigating and doing the weed control and whatnot mm -hmm. on the upper part. They also would have the use of it in that yeah. case. Yeah, that's another good point. So since uh, this property is technically not closed to the public, so if you are up there, you you will have the ability to walk around. There's a gate uh, at the corner of this pasture up here. So uh, see the trail system. Yeah, I don't have a laser pointer, but um, right, <laughs> right there, if you can see that wiggle, there's a gate there. And so the public can go through there. We wanted to keep that as a public space and those lessees certainly can can walk through there um so that's how we've constructed it so yeah. far anything else steve no Craig. well i don't want to infer too much from the photo i'm just wondering i don't know when this picture was taken if it's applicable but is the what's the condition of the area where the the animals are kept and the operation is it dusty is it is it dry is it desiccated or um I know you're, you're working okay, right. on a plan for it, sure. but just what's the condition, what has been the condition of that? Well, when we, when we took it on, there was a, it wasn't as uh, nice as we'd like to see it, but uh, the lessees who are there now, they've gone through and they've uh, trucked out some of some old manure piles and they've cleaned up some uh, some of the other places. And I think this little area that's, it's kind of like the horse, the uh, the holding pen there uh that one it got beat up a little bit it looked like there were some old foundations where a uh, modular home probably sat there so there's a lot of work that has to be done it's in better shape than it was we actually tore down a modular home there as well um but uh it's uh it looks nice now they've repainted the fencing they've so they've been working on it They've been working on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions for Paul? <clears throat> okay. This is, um, I'm going to get a motion and then I'll open it for a public hearing. Move to approve the ordinance of the Board of County Commissioners of Pitkin County authorizing an outfitter and agricultural lease of the Coke Ovens open space between the Board of County Commissioners and Avalanche Outfitters LLC. I'll second. I have a motion. I have a second. This is a public hearing. Are there any members of the public wishing to comment on this item? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the vote, to the board for a vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes 5-0. Thank you. And Paul, don't go anywhere. Okay. It's so. all day today, again. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, again, we have our third and final lease for you here today. This uh this property, um, uh, outlined in yellow, is the entire Grace Shehai open space, which was purchased uh, back in 2010 by Open Space Trails in Pickin County. Uh, and the area uh, in that kind of fluorescent -y green is the Basalt Community Garden, uh, which is not up for lease, but uh, that brown area just uh, between that pink area, which is the bike uh, bike park and a pump track that was also installed. Uh, so that brown area in between is a uh, hay meadow, which um, uh, came along with the property. Um, and this property is a little different too. We didn't actually put this out to bid um, because we don't have water rights tied to this property. And we didn't feel it was appropriate to put it out to bid and, and uh, possibly change something or cause any detriment to the to the land and and uh, in the past past few years we've been leasing this property to Billy Grange who uh, owns the property just to the north there um, and uh, he's uh, he's actually been irrigating it using his water rights and I know at the last meeting there was a question about if that was uh, I don't know uh, if it was legal or if it was a good idea, but I did have a chance to talk with Bill Blakesley, the water commissioner for our area, and uh, he said that he didn't have a problem with that so long as that ditch wasn't on call. So the way he put it is as long as there's uh, quote-unquote free water 
he didn't have a problem with Billy using his ditch to spill water on our property. So uh, we felt comfortable offering uh, Billy another five years. And um, the management plan for this property, as it as it is right now, says that um, we would uh, continue working with uh, uh, we'll continue hay production and and uh, using it as a pasture until a, a new agricultural use came up and we have no new agricultural use so uh, we'd like to get Billy on there for another five years and until something changes possibly okay. uh, just looking at the, the community garden I know that's not part of this lease but uh, where are they getting the water I think they have an agreement with uh, well I don't know with Billy but I think <laughs> it's yeah town of assault <laughs> yeah. great thanks good question I make a motion. Are you ready? Yes, make a sir. motion to approve the authorization of an agricultural lease of the Grace Shehai open space between the Board of County Commissioners and the Grange family ranches. Second. I have a motion. I have a second. This is a public hearing. Are there any members of the public wishing to speak on this item? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 The motion passes 5 0. Is that a nod? It's an aye. I'm watching you, Greg. I'm watching you. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you. So thank you very much, Paul. You 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 are excused now. I think we're done. Oh, thanks, Paul. Sorry. Um, we have a resolution of the Board of County Commissioners um, authorizing the county manager's office to submit a grant application to the Department of Local Affairs Energy Mineral Impact Assistance Fund, um, and if approved, to accept the grant for a best and brightest intern. Kara, hi. Please introduce yourself <laughs> for the public. Kara Silvernagel, manager's <laughs> office. Um, so before you, this is second reading. Um, to submit a grant to the Department of Local Affairs, they require a resolution that the board supports the submission of the grant. And so that's the resolution that's before you today. And it is for a best and brightest intern to begin in 2018. Um, we have selected the best and brightest intern and he'll start once we move back up Valley um, so that we have space because it's a little tight down in Basalt. Um, and so, and it is included in the budget for 2018 and 2019. And Except we are going to give him some special projects during the legislative session. I had the opportunity to meet this young man, and I think we're all going to be very excited by his energy, his passion, and his commitment to this community and to public service. Yes, absolutely. And I think it's going to be great. Any questions? Sure. Just once again, he comes from somewhere in the lower valley, mid valley? Yeah, he's uh, from Sill, living in Rifle Sill area. He's looking right. for housing basically anywhere between there and basalt right now but he lives there his um, grandparents actually are from basalt so he has long ties to this valley and I think provides a lot of great culture and heritage to um, as we look at all the different items that he'll be working on excellent that's great Good goosebumps any other comments or questions seeing none jump right in there guys it's a long one <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to make motion. a motion uh, that we support resolution of the Board of County Commissioners, Pitkin County, authorizing County Manager's Office to submit a grant application to the Department of Local Affairs, Energy, and Mineral Impact Assistance Fund, um, <sighs> and to accept the grant for Best and Brightest Intern for 218 and 19. Second. I have a motion and a second. Um, this is also a public hearing. Any members of the public wishing to comment on this item? Seeing none. Um, I'll bring it back to the board for a vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 And now, John, you're, the next item is not public comment for the emergency ordinance, correct? That's correct. So I'm going to close the public comment for today. And um, we'll do this one, and then we can take a break. Or do you want to take a break before the Phillips? We're good? Go. No. Okay. So the next item is an emergency ordinance of the Board of County Commissioners authorizing the purchase of the Phillips trailer court <coughs> finally that's not on there I added that we could put that in yeah we should put that in <laughs> finally the, and this um, is being done by an emergency ordinance because uh, well because we are looking to close on the acquisition inside of the typical uh, notice and posting deadlines for a regularly adopted ordinance uh, the anticipated closing dead, uh, date 
uh, right now is February 12th. I don't see anything, at least currently, that would um, knock us off of that date. The acquisition of the property has been discussed by the board for more than a year and a half. The, uh, the discussion, um, in fact, produced an earlier adopted ordinance back in December of 2016 uh, to proceed with, uh, with a contract and acquisition during the course of a previously executed contract um, and the exploration and inspection of the property and, and other diligence items, it was discovered that the, um, the septic system on the property was worse than what we were originally anticipating. The cost of the remedy for that um, uh, potentially uh, was taking the county out of acquiring the property. Um, in fact, the earlier adopted contract has since lapsed and there is no contractual relationship right now between the parties between the owners of the property and Pickens County this ordinance will allow for the execution of a new contract uh, with a obviously a new anticipated closing date most of the items typically associated with diligence under a real estate contract have already been accomplished while we were under contract previously so at this time, other than a, uh, an updated title review of the property, we are essentially in a position to proceed with closing. The anticipated, uh, well, the, the stated price for the acquisition will be $6.5 million, um, plus uh, associated closing costs and transaction fees. The uh, property is approximately 76 acres in size, located in uh, the Mid Valley. It's in fact just at the south end of Snowmass Canyon. Right now, there are numerous uh, trailer homes on the property, as well as four individual cabins and one house that is uh, of some age. I'm not sure when it was actually constructed. It wasn't an original homestead uh, house, but it's been around for a long. Time. Uh, it's uh, certainly pushing 80 years. Um, at any rate, the, the property currently provides uh, space rental for trailers, uh, for 35 trailers. There is an additional space that's available for rent, but right now is occupied by a storage trailer. There are four, as I mentioned, cabins uh, and, uh, and the, the one older uh, ranch house. Most of the housing is located on the east side of the river, on the river road side of the river, uh, although there are the four cabins and six uh, trailers are located on the east side or the west side of the river um, just off of Highway 82. There is egress and ingress back into the highway uh, with a loop configured road. Uh, in addition to the, um, to the housing uh, on the property, there are three significantly sized irrigated pastures uh, as well as significant river frontage. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the guesstimate is that the river frontage is about three quarters of a mile long uh, and uh, the, uh, the river frontage presents the county with some, uh, some potential other uses to the property. It's anticipated at this point that uh, not all of the property will be utilized for affordable housing pur purposes, although the entire purchase is being funded out of affordable housing funds right now. Uh, the county preserves for itself within the body of the ordinance the ability to retask other portions of the property, either to sell the other portions of the property on the free market or to dedicate other portions of the property to other programs within the county, for example, open space or healthy rivers. That, that uh, decision uh, for the board uh, is something that we can decide in the future after the closing occurs. The uh, ultimate use of the property uh, is also somewhat of a anticipated, I guess, a lengthy discussion uh, as to the um, encouragement or formation of a, a residence association or potentially in the future a homeowners association whether or not to subdivide the uh, existing spaces or reconfigure the existing spaces into a, uh, a more suitable geometric uh, you know configuration uh, to uh, allow spaces to uh, one subdivided to be 
acquired, purchased by qualified uh, residents or continue to lease them or to have some blend of that. And of course, there will be discussions uh, as to the appropriate final size uh, and number of units of affordable housing to be placed on the property. And those discussions, of course, would be had with the uh, Woody Creek Caucus, as well as uh, members of the public who might want to participate and the, um, the immediate area and other property owners uh, uh, that would um, uh, feel impacts from the use of the property. So with that, and recommend for the board the adoption of this emergency ordinance which would allow us to go forward with execution of appropriate documents including a contract and to close on the property uh, probably February 12th. George. All right, a couple questions. John, um, you mentioned that the, the, uh, the property consists of about 76 acres. Does that include some of the land that's currently owned by the state land board? No. But, but there is an encroachment onto property owned by the state land board, uh, which is in the location of the west side of the river uh, where those six trailers and four cabins is located. In fact, all six trailers encroach onto state property as well as the existing septic system that services the residences on that side of the river. Um, we have talked with represent, uh, representatives uh, of the state land board uh, as well as the attorney general's office and the state is amenable in fact is eager uh, to transact that property with us uh, so that we will uh, ultimately acquire um, that small portion of property it is less than an acre although the exact size is not known right now okay great thanks and then um as we move into this new venture, uh, the management will be fall under the manager's office. Sounds good to me. <laughs> Not the attorney's. <laughs> yeah, George, uh, the uh, the the planning and then infrastructure projects would um, fall under the responsibility of, of departments that um, report to me. Phyllis Matthias will be taking a, a lead on um, bringing folks together. Um, I would imagine that we will have a high involvement from our public works department on the infrastructure side as well as our, our planning department uh, in answering the questions that John laid out in terms of uh, eventual size and scope of, of development of the property. And as, as even such mundane things as collecting rent? Yeah, we will need to figure out the administrative process. Obviously, we are not set up um, at this point where our partnerships have um, typically been um, with our, our housing authority uh, on this. We may choose. Um, we, we have yet to come to what our property management arrangement will, will be on this property, but we'll be working on that. Yeah, great. Thank you. It's evolving as we speak. <clears throat> Rachel, anybody else want to make a comment? I, yeah, I, I, um, I think this is critical. I think for the Board of Commissioners, knowing <coughs> we're taking on a lot, there's a lot of issues, not like we haven't faced those, many of those same issues when we got involved with all the other mobile home parks, trailer courts in the valley. Um, and we, at the end of the day, after a lot of work, have been very successful in maintaining and creating um, some level of affordable housing and keeping members of the community in this community. And for me, that's what this is about. Um, it's going to be a long process. We, we have a lot before us. Um, it's going to take a lot of thought and energy from all parties involved. But the main thing, I think, speaking for myself, and I think speaking for this board, is that we were really concerned about maintaining that level of housing for the people who live there and have been part of this community, many of them for many, many, many years. So um, um, I, I look forward to taking this on, um, and um, hopefully we'll be part of it for the next so many years to come. So um, it's exciting, and I want to thank the attorney's office and John Ely specifically for um, all the efforts that you've put into to try and negotiate this to, uh, so we can come to some terms of agreement, and we're there, and it's pretty amazing, and so thanks. Rachel. Yeah, I, I really want to uh, thank you, Patty, for your comments. I think they're very accurate. 
Um, this is a uh, long process, as many others were. And I, I just wanted to note that how important this housing is in many other communities. It's lost, as you know, being invited to speak uh, in uh, Rhode Island about such topics. But I used to live in Woody Creek when it was a space rental place. And I used to live in Aspen Village when it was a space rental place. And uh, I'm fortunate now to live in Hunter Creek and deed restricted uh, unit. But uh, to see both of those two projects over time through the hard work of the county become permanent homesteads for people and not the potential which both carried at the time of becoming uh, a, a few single family second home lots. And I, I think that that's real important that we don't move out our working class here in this community, that we find ways to preserve them. And uh, it's going to be a long process, and we're just going to take it slow. So thanks again. And you, of course, have lived in Smuggler, which was yeah. preserved as well. <laughs> and, and, you know, when people think about the incredible um, affordable housing program we have in terms of number of units per population, uh, preservation of units has been almost as important as creation of new units. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Craig. I just want to congratulate and thank John for his hard work on this. I know we sent yes. him back to the table. I will say that too. On several occasions, and and uh, and I know it was it was a long slog, but I think the outcome was was really good for for everyone involved. So thank you, thank you for that. Yes. Um, I echo all the comments that have been made so far. I think it's really important. This is a big win for the residents there that this this is their home that many of them have lived there for years and years and um, We're going to be able to preserve that and I'm Concerned about the heavy load of work that we're putting on county employees <laughs> on developing the management Get plan ready. and upgrading the septic system and all the different things that we have to be looking at and I urge the commissioners as we go through this next year or two to uh, keep that in mind to that we're asking a lot of the county staff on this project and to try to not to overload them on other <laughs> other projects that we also have on the, on on the, the list. plate right now <laughs> Okay. We're starting to have a unique business plan as a county, <laughs> very unusual to other counties. We are now a landlord of a bar, of a Chinese restaurant, and of a mobile park home. Mm -hmm. I hope we don't see a used car dealership. <laughs> <in China. laughs> Anytime soon. You never know. <laughs> we have to get more creative. In our and we're not going into marijuana medical or retail, um, I'm hoping. Um, and I just want to add, Rachel was right. I was, in October, was invited to speak to... Um, Prosperity now has a conference called I'm Home, and I spoke on, believe it or not, the preservation of manufactured housing communities. And I started off my preservations by saying, well, in Picking County, we call that how do you save a trailer court. Um, and I gathered a lot of support, and I have a list of people who have been waiting for me to call who maybe want to join in some form of partnerships with helping Picking County with land use, with opportunities for um, upgrades, and, and just ideas that have been used around the country. So I thank the board for giving me the time to go speak at that conference, and now I can pull in those cards that I collected while I was there and make some phone calls, and I look forward to that. So, again, thanks for the efforts, and bring it on. We're ready to go. So, does any member of the board willing to make a motion here? I would love to make a motion. I haven't got the, re oh, I do have the resolution in front of me. I would make a motion uh, to approve an emergency ordinance of the Board of County Commissioners of Picking County, of Picking County, Colorado, authorizing the purchase of the Phillips Mobile Home Park. Second. I have a motion and I have a second and there's no public comment on this that will be at the confirmatory reading so I am very pleased to call this question all those in favor please signify by saying aye aye aye, aye. aye. motion passes 5-0 thank you would the board like to take a break before we start on the last item yes please yep okay. yeah, break. so we'll take 10 or 15 10 10 grassroots we're going to take 10 thank you 36 
Are we ready? Welcome back. This is Wednesday, January the 24th, 2018. This is a regular meeting of the Pitkin County Board of County Commissioners. We have, I believe, one last, one last item on our regular agenda under land use actions. It's a resolution approving the White Hawk Ranch LLC amendment um, regarding the prohibition of dogs. All right, so I am Tammy Cochin, Pickin County Planner, and the applicant for this item is the White Hawk Ranch LLC, who is represented today with um, Jonathan Losky with Colorado Wildlife Science LLC. Uh, the subject property is located, as you can see on this map, at 825 Old Huron Road. Um, it's also commonly referred to as Lot 44 of Sopris Mountain Ranch and contains 36.8 acres. So it's this parcel here. Um, so if you're not familiar with this area, this is uh, West Sopers Creek Road coming up this valley here. Um, pursuant to the BOCC Resolution 91171, which approved the general submission for the 32 acres in Sopers Mountain Ranch a blanket condition for the parcels exists that states that no dog shall be allowed uh, just due to the significant wildlife habitat in the general area. Um, following that original resolution, there were um, several additional development approvals that were granted to this par property, which include administrative decision numbers uh, 50, 2009, 53, 2014, and 12, 2016. Each of those subsequent approvals carried along the dog prohibition um, as well. And so our land use code has historically prohibited dogs when a property <coughs> is within or adjacent to mapped or field verified um, elk, mule deer, bighorn sheep, um, severe winter range, winter concentration areas, and production areas. Um, the subject parcel is not mapped within these significant areas. And this past October, the Colorado Parks and Wildlife District Manager, John Groves, uh, conducted a site visit and also f did a field verification that this property was not within those significant habitat areas. Um, he did note in some correspondence with the applicant that um, it could be argued that a, a dog prohibition um, may be warranted, but it's often unrealistic, um, and that a kennel restriction um, may be recommended instead is, and is often more enforceable. Um, so pursuant to Land Use Code Section 22150, a minor m amendment to a development application may be approved um, if it's consistent with the original approval. Um, so while a kennel restriction isn't the same as a dog prohibition, it's um, somewhat consistent. And uh, to ensure that wildlife habitat is preserved and impacts on wildlife are mitigated, staff finds that it is also appropriate to require dogs to be kenneled within 50 feet of the residential buildings or leashed or under su human su supervision and outside of the required kennel as recommended by the Colorado Parks and Wildlife. So um, in conclusion, um, because the parcel is not mapped or field verified within the significant wildlife habitat areas, and as confirmed by John Groves of CPW, staff recommends that the BOCC adopt a motion to approve the White Hawk Ranch LLC minor amendment subject to the attached resolution. And I'll turn it over to Jonathan from here. Let me just see if the board has any oh, questions sorry. for staff. Does the board have any questions? Yeah. So, Tammy, the, um, what, as you say, the request is the applicant is requesting to amend the prior, to, to amend the prior, prior approvals in order to allow dogs on the parcel within a kennel. Mm -hmm. there, there have been some of the original lots that uh, were not restricted uh, to not, were unrestricted in terms of allowing dogs. My, my question is uh, to allow dogs, that's the, you've got that in, in the plural. So have we ever had a discussion in terms of how many dogs are allowed on a property? I think there have been prior approvals that did restrict dogs, do, dogs to two or so. Yeah, um, we had that one not too long ago. Uh, I thought. 
that. Yeah. We have, I think, sometimes put a limit one or two. Usually we're getting that directly from the Colorado Parks and Wildlife. There's nothing in the code that says, you know, we, we sort of talk about dogs or no dogs, um, you know, but, but I think when the, we have seen a few where we did have a restriction to a specific number um, or, or for the life of this dog, that was, that goes back a ways. Um, yeah. We tried that once too um, and they just kept naming the next but, dog. But, the but nothing in the code is specific about that. No, I understand that, but we, there are some parcels, even some of the original parcels that uh, were not restricted. And I'm just curious, yeah. do we know with, within some of those parcels how, how many dogs the property owner has and are they all being kenneled? Do we have any sort of background on that? We, I know, I'm sure we don't. I know, I mean, I don't know if Jonathan and his, you know, pulling this together has any background information on that um, since he's looked more closely at the the subdivision yeah that would be a question so John, John's going to answer that but I think we'll, we'll need to discuss uh, when you when when the request is to allow dogs to to uh, refine that a little bit because is it one dog is it six dogs yeah and we did that on that one property we also I believe to the best of my memory did an issue about visiting quote-unquote dogs mm -hmm. about people bringing their dogs over for doggy parties Visit. and and yeah. in the resolution that I did include some language that oh, speaks I, to like construction dogs or um, oh you know dogs I read it I read it and highlighted it for some dogs. reason um, I think that that should be part of the discussion but I think number of dogs and I also think a definition of under human supervision would be nice to know what does that mean yeah, what is human supervision? The other yeah. question I'll have just quickly is uh, because Silverman Mountain Ranch is sort of an example where we have a lot of inconsistencies. Some parcels are allowed, some are not. So here you've got a request from a, a new owner and probably not the original owner of that lot. Um, and I think I'm looking to staff to provide us with some language for some sort of consistency so that uh, future boards and future owners know what to expect or not expect. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. Greg. Right. Please. Just yeah, you know, to follow on George, just looking at the map here, if we've got the blue is kennel restriction, yellow outline is dog prohibition. This is I guess been changing uh, as on an ad piecemeal right. basis over time. Right. Exactly. And the the question I'd have is if uh, John Groves is looking at the practical nature, he's saying, "Well, we're going to have a hard time regulating dogs up there. Mm -hmm. Let's just put a kennel restriction in." But is there any follow up or monitoring after that? You know, once they recommend that, do we know if it happens? I, at CO, there's definitely a check to make sure that the kennel is built to CPW standards. Um, and then any subsequent um, building inspections that our department does, um, we'd hopefully check for that. But other than that, um, and parks, and, parks and Wildlife probably doesn't. It doesn't. They don't doesn't have go the time and energy to do it, and it would be a neighborhood complaint issue. Yeah, right? maybe that's what it comes. Same down. on our end, you know, Parks and Wildlife right doesn't have hasn't been able to follow up on that, and we have had no program internally with the county. All of the times we've granted these approvals with a prohibition or a restriction unless we hear a complaint right. we've never had any program of you know really looking looking for compliance as opposed to waiting for for a, a you know an, an enforcement action right and, to your and, knowledge have we had complaints we actually just got one last week for a parcel up in redstone um oh we, we, was called on i mean we get them yeah. periodically throughout the county um i don't know specifically you know if yeah that but we've they had may anything. not have had a dog, dog restriction it may just have been a dog yeah uh, we don't know that specific parcel what act there was a dog restriction and they did have a dog on the property yeah. i don't know what but, and we'd have you know <laughs> we right definitely so. have had enforcement actions come out of you know a, a complaint and when we looked at the approvals you know if there was a okay. prohibition we have followed up on that but none where we've had kenneling that we know of an enforcement related to kenneling yeah, versus not i don't know i yeah. think usually it's been more right it's strict prohibition no dogs or, or okay. dogs yeah rachel yeah um this issue in general not your specific application has come before the board a number of times and i'm thinking more about when michael was on the board in discussions uh it was uh, maybe in owl creek or other uh, up towards independence pass 
And we, we've talked a little about developing more of a dog policy um, to kind of clarify this. And, you know, I think Greg makes a good point when you look at all the parcels that have a dog prohibition that could potentially come in and ask for Jonathan's work to talk to Park and Wildlife and to our staff in order to lift or change that to a kenneling restriction. I'd just like to kind of put a, a, a thought out there that maybe we should consider revising that on a broader scale. Um, maybe not. Maybe there's reasons not to. But it would be really hard for me to argue to the folks in 48 or 47 that they have to keep a dog prohibition once I've lifted it and said kenneling on 44. And, uh, you know, what that also kind of leads me to is the bigger question, if we don't have anything in our code, is to start talking about perhaps numbers of dogs or start talking about fines for um, violations. violations. And I think that would be the key. Uh, you know, you, you hope everyone obeys and, and follows the proposal. And we all know why there are dog restrictions. Elk, deer, other wildlife really suffer from dogs at loose, let alone horses. And, you know, they can ride on top of the snow. The other animals are breaking through. Uh, it can, uh, you know, the, the cost of one deer, one elk, you know, when you think even in terms of hunting tags or this or that, uh, I, I'm not sure that we have enough of a true deterrent right now. And so perhaps we could look at reviewing that and thinking about that sometime in the workload of the coming year. Well, yeah, that's a good idea. But I also think that in a case by case, then we have the DO, um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife coming in and, and doing the, the wildlife mapping. Um, and it's my understanding that this parcel, you know, please, Jonathan, correct me, does not have uh, issues of actual mapping. Um, and that's why the, the CPW was a little more comfortable. But I'll let you address that when we get to it. Yeah, I'll get to that. Let me make sure that I know that, Greg, were you finished? I might have cut you off. Okay, go ahead, Steve. Um, there's no site plan map in the in the application and maybe your microphone um and maybe there isn't one developed yet but i'm i'm curious you. about where the uh it's proposed to have the kennel in relationship to where the house is and where in relation to the cdu in relation to the the woods around the house the houses well it's required to be w within 50 feet of the house yeah wait a minute I'll, I'm gonna, I'll let him get back but you so need to is it for the main now is the proposal for the dog or dogs for the main house and not for the CDU I think that's probably what the request is yeah for the primary residence yeah and so the, and this one's actually I I don't know if you can see this well on this map but Currently, there is a, actually a building permit issued. Area. You can see the disturbed area right in here. Um, and I think they're finishing up with that residence, and it's a thousand square foot residence. So they are building it um, as their primary residence right now, but it's it could eventually be a C, most likely be a CDU, and they would build an additional single family residence. Um, as it's written right now, it doesn't state which one the CDU or the you know, future primary residence has the kennel. Um, also, looking at the big picture, the fact that there are 32 lots and some people might have two dogs, we, there could potentially be 64 dogs living on, on this ranch, all in kennels, all barking at the same time at some coyotes or something. Mm -hmm. And I think even if they're in their kennels, that would be disruptive to or could be disruptive to the wildlife around there That's true, Jim. Mm -hmm. just because of the sheer numbers of dogs that could potentially be there so I mm -hmm. think we need to look at some sort of bigger solution for the yeah. whole for the whole subdivision yeah any other questions for staff yes, I guess I'm just gonna assume that the CPW has a blanket policy not just with this subdivision but across the entire region where if they if they don't think it's practical to have an enforcement uh, or prohibition they suggest a kenneling which kind of opens up all these questions so um, I would love to hear what Colorado Parks and Wildlife is is doing on this and and if they think something needs to be done on our end I haven't had a conversation in recent time with CPW about prohibition but in the past um, our understanding from them was always that it was great if we would prohibit dogs, but they would never make that recommendation. 
um, that that okay. sort of exceeded their you know their their authority. Um, that they, you know, looked for, for restrictions and that I think they were appreciative of Pitkin County and our willingness to prohibit in certain cases. But I think they're all, in and again, Jonathan can probably speak to it. I think, you know, there has been, you know, thinking over time, right, a kennel is, is something physical. You can be very clear, you know, about knowing this is where, when I buy this property, this is where my dog is supposed to go. So I think, that, you know, there have been different theories, but in the past we have, for the most part, not gotten a, a, a straight a direction from CPW saying, you know, prohibit dogs, that that, that won't be necessarily be part of their recommendation. Um, they certainly would like to see dogs restricted, and so I think they're more often working in the realm of what restrictions can you provide, do the kenneling, um, that a prohibition is something that comes more from the county as okay. opposed from from CPW. Yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah, it, it it clearly is an issue that uh, borders on protecting a community and common good like the wildlife and the private property rights of the individual. And um, we've seen in the past where even if it's severe winter range, they have a hard time saying, no, don't build. They, they, they just really can't go over that edge with private property right issues, but they'll let you know they're very, very concerned. Yeah. And, and in this case, I think Again, it, for me, it comes back to a lot of site specifics because you can't map this whole thing as severe winter range when maybe portions of it are. So, Steve, you're right. It could be, you know, bazillion dogs, but maybe not all these properties would be appropriate. It'd have to be on site specific rather than just a blanket. Everybody can have a, two dogs in a kennel. There may be some properties that it's just not appropriate for. So if we are done with staff, we will turn it over to the applicant, please. So um, you need to introduce yourself for Jonathan the Jonathan Lowski, <laughs> uh, wildlife biologist and principal of Colorado Wildlife Science. Um, first, I want to say that I've been working out at Sopris Mountain Ranch and adjacent properties like Deadwood Ranch um, you know, for the past 20 years and have spent a lot of time uh, conducting wildlife assessments, specifically production area assessments in that area, and specifically um, spent a lot of time with um, John Groves up in this area for lot 39. Um, recently did a bunch of work looking at, at the habitat when um, it was a Sopris Verde when their um, mm. marijuana application came in because we were looking at the effects of, of fencing on that area. Um, I did um, worked on Deadwood Ranch and the conservation easement on Deadwood Ranch and, and a few of the other properties around there. Um, so I've become very familiar with that. Um, uh, both with, um, spent a lot of time up there, but both with Kevin Wright and John Groves. Um, now, um, it's important to point out that beginning with, um, with the Lot 39 assessment, um, John Groves and I spent a bunch of time up there looking at the, uh, the CPW mapping, looking at the actual Aspen habitat up there in terms of um, what was... Um, appropriate or, or usable by elk for production habitat um, and, and tying that into what he's observed in the air over the years. And this is um, the, what the land use code calls the field verified um, suitable uh, elk production habitat. That's in the orange. And then the purple is the quarter mile buffer uh, from there. Um, so, um, so that being said, for lot 44, since it lies not only outside of suitable elk production habitat, it also lies outside of the, of the quarter mile buffer, uh, there's no code provision that, that specifically would say um, that there's any restrictions on dog other than a kennel restriction because it, this is all within um, winter range. And there, I've got a blue line over here. I don't know if you can see it that goes like this and around there. So all of this is winter range. And the land use code does require a kennel restriction within uh, winter range. Um, the other thing is I went back through um, the original uh, Sopris Mountain Ranch land use application. And in there, it did have a uh, condition of approval for um, dog prohibition on those lots that came in on that um, land use application. Not all of the lots within Sopris Mountain Ranch were in that application. Um, since then, a few of the lots, including 
um, lot 39 and a couple of the others uh, when they, um, whether it was to um, reestablish vested rights or some other reason, they did get a change from um, the dog prohibition to um, the uh, kennel restriction. And then, um, I, so for example, that might be lot 23, there's a big cluster here as well. And then down here, there's um, a these two that have kennel restrictions again because they're in within winter range the rest of these still have prohibitions on them and um there was one and i can't remember which one there was one that i couldn't it it didn't have any restriction on dogs that i could find um so which and i don't know if that was 35 or 36 it was one of those but um the um to um and then you know just to get an idea, some of these, so, if, so this is lot 44 here. You have lot 47, which is um, similar elevation to 44. 49 is higher, 39 is higher. And, you know, if you remember from that other map, uh, go back to it, the, um, the production habitat is up here. So some of those that have kennel restrictions are actually closer to the, the active production area than lot 44 is. Um, there's also s some good habitat over here. Um, so I I'm, I'm glad you, you guys had the discussion you did uh, before my presentation because it's, it, and some of you have heard this from me before, in, in a perfect world, it would be great if um, f in some areas of the county where you are adjacent to production areas, you're adjacent or within severe winter range, winter concentration areas, migration corridors, if we had a dog prohibition. Um, the problem is that after the original applicant, um, realtors don't then tell people that there's a dog prohibition, certainly, because it lowers property value. And, and people don't read, when you buy a property, don't read the, their original resolution of approval. So two, three, four owners down the road, they're there's a good chance that any given property is going to have dogs. And um, last year, a, a really good example, I was actually on the um, on an open space property uh, along Lower River Road um, that was um, newly acquired. What's what's the name of that property? Chuck Terrick's old property? Deer, Deer, Deer Creek. Creek. And um, I was there with four CPW officers, a biologist from, from the Forest Service, and a biologist from the BLM, as well as and Gary Tenenbaum, and we watched two labs um, from an adjacent house chase two bull elk up the hillside to a ditch and chase them until they were gone over a mile. And that house has a dog prohibition on it, but there's no fenced yard. And so... And no kennel. And, and, the and no kennel. <laughs> and, and under the land use code, when, we, when, we, when the land use code refers to kennel, they basically mean a fenced yard that's within, adjacent to the house with, and within 50 feet. Um, and so from my opinion, from what I've seen over the last 20 years, is that I would rather have, if, if you're in close proximity to or, or within, an important wildlife habitat, and a habitat where dogs can cause disruption. And um, it's important to note that over the last 10, 15 years, there's been a number of, of peer-reviewed studies that have come out um, clearly showing that dogs substantially extend the zone of influence that extends out from either recreation areas or from, from residences. Dogs are very disruptive. As you know, when you walk with a dog, for every mile you walk, they walk they run five all over the place. And, and um, so in places like this, I would rather see a physical barrier adjacent to the house that's within the zone of influence, especially in an area, a, a, a subdivision like Sopris Mountain Ranch and Lot 44, where you know the zones of influence um, overlap. You have clustering in there so that, you know, and, and it's clustered, you know, again, adjacent to other houses that have kennel restrictions and you have the barking dogs to know that if people get up in the morning make their cup of coffee and let the dog out or the dog goes to their doggy door they can only go so 50 far. feet and wildlife are habituate to human disturbance or to disturbance in general and so if 
you know, anywhere, you know, there's a gap, you know, whether it's, um, so, you know, as Tammy said, the development for this it, um, residence is here, but you've got a bunch of, of sort of scraggly aspen up through here and here. So if the animals know that that dog can only go so far, um, because there's a physical barrier, deer and elk will continue to use that area. Um, but if, if there's no barrier and those dogs can go anywhere, they will cease to use that habitat. Um, so I have a conceptual issue with the dog prohibition because as, as you were just discussing and Suzanne was elaborating on, um, you know, CPW will write a ticket if, and, and um, Matt Yamashita did in that Lower River Road incident, if they observe dogs chasing wildlife, they can write a ticket and they can even um, put the dog down. Um, as you remember, Kevin Wright did a few years ago at um, Shadow Mountain. He had to put two huskies down because they were killing an elk. Um, but um, unless there's a complaint by a neighbor, there's no way that the county or CPW has the resources or the time to go and, and check that. Whereas at CO, like Tammy and Suzanne were saying, um, you can verify that there is a kennel. CPW can be asked to go out and make sure that it meets their standards. Um, invisible fences don't work um, when it comes to wildlife because dogs will run right through it, get the adrenaline will go, they'll get their little shock, but then the problem is then once the adrenaline comes back down, they won't come back in because they'd have to get another shock. So it has to be a physical barrier. It has to be high enough that a dog can't jump over it. Um, and so I, I think it would be great if, if um, the board would have a work session and invite, you know, CPW, um, you know, Perry Will and, and the district wildlife manager to discuss it conceptually. Because I see it all the time that, you know, two, three, four owners down the road, uh, a, dog, a house with a prohibition ultimately has a dog. Um, so that being said, and I, I digressed a little bit. Um, no, I'm ha question. happy to answer any questions. George, please. So my question is, when, it, when we look at, uh, let's say, lot 23 and even lot 39, uh, I mean, they're surrounded by dog prohibitions. And, um, and I, I don't know how that conversation went at, at, at some point before the, the, uh, the previous board here. But it surprises me that you've got sort of a, like 20 feet. It's almost like a little inholding that's surrounded mm -hmm. by prohibition. Uh, it doesn't make any. Uh, My guess is that 23 wasn't part of the original submission. Yeah, I'd have to look back at what numbers. Or they came were back apart. in and had it. Or came back. They came back in, but there's, there's, uh, we don't. Again, I go back to we don't have any sort of consistent policy for Soper's Mountain Ranch, and as you noted, Jonathan, which I agree is. As uh, lots go up for sale, and there's always lots for sale up there, and you've got uh, change of ownerships, and it's, it's, um, no one's doing that due diligence in, in terms of reading the, the fine script and what's allowable and what's not allowable. And that should not fall back on, on us to have to try to make, make those changes or try to appease a potential new owner because they didn't do their own due diligence. That's that's really not our responsibility. But our responsibility is to come up with a consistent plan so we know what we're doing, at least for future boards, that we don't come into these these little cases. Because once you start opening up the door for for 44, well, I could see 49 coming in or 43 or 45 coming in in the future. Mm -hmm. Well, and George, and, and, and for me, they would have to because this has already been an approval. So in the future, though, or at least we would have, I think what we're trying to go for is some standard guidelines because we could have all of these at some point that, aren't, that are still restricted come back in. But that would have to be on a case-by-case -case basis because I don't think this board would necessarily just do a blanket-wide removal of the dog prohibition because there may be some parcels that it's not appropriate for based well, on CPW mapping, et cetera. Right, and, and George, there is... In the, in the code right now, there is a prohibition when, um, when a property is within or adjacent to mapped or field verified areas. So uh, there, there are standards to some degree. Um, but I think having right, so a work session like Jonathan has suggested where we could come in and just fine tune <clears throat> the, 
the the kenneling and and we said to the permanent the primary resident or to the caretaker resident or you know those those kind of issues so we have some standards number of dogs mm -hmm. and um just real quick side note visiting dogs i don't see under d though unless tither yeah. is that i know that just that, that was that? <laughs> typo it should be an o right there other service oh, providers others. I'm like, that's an interesting <laughs> word. But I, I think visitors should be added in there because yeah. visitors, you know, you may not be compatible to, to kennel your dog with the owner's dogs. And, mm -hmm. you know, will they leave their dogs in the car? Will they just bring them over and let them run wild? One other question. Uh, so, Jonathan, since you're, uh, you're representing the applicant, are they at, do we know, are they asking for one dog, two dogs, three dogs? I think currently they have two small dogs. Two dogs. Okay. Um, and I, I'm trying to remember, there are two small white dogs. Well, the last time we did this, we yep, limited it to two dogs, and we did yep. not allow working dogs because there was no clear dogs. definition of working okay. dogs. And, and if you look, you, again, the purple is the quarter-mile buffer from the field verified um, production habitat, and I think these are, are deed-restricted open space. This, the, um, this Some is, of those other parcels? I don't think there's there's development um, on this but but these lots um, well except for 39 where the, the uh, past board allowed the uh, kennel restriction but these you know under the land use code there's a, there is a prohibition um, but again you know I so you know so let's say for lot 43 on which I don't know if there is development um, certainly 45 there's not and Oh, no, 45 there is. There's down here. Um, but um, if, if you say a prohibition and then, you know, just a couple years down the road, and this is Dinkle Lake over here, um, a few years down the road, those people get a couple of labs or German shepherds um, without a kennel. Those dogs can, you know, run up in here. And, and you know, the other thing is, you know, Soper's Mountain Ranch, especially this end of the ranch, um, um, and to a lesser extent, uh, on this side are used for you know transition and, and migration um, and so I really the idea of a prohibition with no physical barriers for when they do get those dogs down the road um, worries me yeah all right yeah Greg please so an open question for who might understand can is there any way we can require um, that the dog prohibition it must be put in the real estate disclosures and any any it's got to be part of the disclosures for a, a real estate transaction maybe it's just so there's so many disclosures they don't notice you're supposed to read the document you're supposed to read the document and you know you can only teach people how much so of the much, disclosure can you ignore I guess is the question yeah so there's or, nothing else we can do to or decide uh, we'll see what happens right you know sure. I, mean, I read it but we'll see what happens yeah. So, Steve, 44 got it. So why can't we? Write? Yeah, a couple of points. Um, it talks in earlier approvals for this, the land. It talked about where all fencing must be wildlife friendly fencing. <laughs> then except, you add the dog kennels. Except for the kennel. Yeah. And then it mm -hmm. has a thing like except for the kennels. Mm -hmm. um, I think we. I don't know how how closely the our regulations define what a what type of fence is uh, good for a kennel but we might need to investigate that and make sure yeah that everybody knows what a kennel fence and uh, what yeah. how is it built how tall does it have to be uh, and we always look to what see keeps the dogs from digging underneath the fence all those different kind of aspects of it yeah, and I think we probably could work with CPW to define that because they obviously have those standards. And when they they have gone out and checked at CEO to make sure it's what what they deem as. <laughs> yeah, I would look at the proof. other ones that we had approvals for that we were we changed this. The one that we did most recently, gosh, old, um, West Sopras or no East Sopras? Yeah, there was one we did. And, um, and they had a kennel, and it was very specific in its design. But if I can rack my brain, Suzanne, I can see is racking her brain, too. No, I, 
Yeah. The, so was it that 5809 East Silver's Creek Road? Yeah, there was one up there. So we had a dog when I was a kid in Denver. It was a beagle. And this is where we were introduced to how to build a fence. This dog could escape from our yard, which would fit any definition of a kennel. It was like a dog-proof yard, and the dog would get out. The dog was caught by the Dumb Friends League in Denver, and it escaped from there. <laughs> so, That's because it so was the Dumb Friends League. You know, uh, a fence is offense if it, if it works. But, right. um, and I do have comments about the word thither. <laughs> I, thought that was a I cool did word. some research into it, and one of the definitions is to that place. So if you would say contractors, caretakers, or to that place service providers, kind of meaning it might mean service providers who are going to that place to work, or it might be totally a typo and <laughs> it was, it was say so other a. or That's some a. other word. GRU. And I'm really curious if that shows up any place else in any other uh, resolutions or land use approvals in Pitkin County. And it's going to now. Tammy does have a line in the resolution um, that says that failure to comply with the conditions of this proposal may result in revocation. Right. So if they start, you know, letting them outside the kennel, and you know, I think that's important when you, Patty, mentioned. Um, it, I forget what, what the terminology you used, uh, in human control. Yeah, um, uh, human supervision. So human, it, you know, in places like this where, you, you know, there are elk that, that are on Sopus Mountain Ranch that are using it, voice controls don't work. It should be required that, and, and I've often... Just be leashed. Um, I, I don't know whether I put it, recommended that in this one, but usually I say when outside the kennel must be on a leash. Yeah, I, I agree that. with that. I would so, amend the reso so to I'm, I'm just going to kind of summarize here. I, I would like to see that changed. Um, it should just be or leashed. They should just be leashed whenever they're outside. I think we need to have some kind of clarification as to where the kennel is going to be located, the ADU. Um, I think it should be by the main residence because I think that's where the dogs will be because the, the caretakers should not have dogs, so the dogs will be at the main house. Mm -hmm. So the location is more appropriate. Um, I think the number of dogs should be limited to two. And I think we should add under other service providers, visitors. Um, I think that they should, just like a service provider, should have to keep their dogs in their car and not bring them because those dogs may be, you know, they don't understand the property. And I don't think that you can kennel all of the dogs that come to visit you in one kennel because that could be total mayhem. Um, and I think that should just be part of it. And I also made a note that we will put on our list for future uh, work sessions a discussion about dog prohibitions and allowance of dogs and what kind of what kind of um, parameters we want to have in there with being in CPW and others. And it would be great if Jonathan could be there since he works with this a lot. Rachel. Thank you, Patty. I um, agree with everything you said, except for I'd like to add one modification gotcha. and throw in my dog story. Uh, friends of mine in Grand Junction have a full-blooded Basset Hound, and uh, although they tried very hard to keep it separated from my son's blue healer black lab mix, um, they had a romantic encounter last summer, and they oh, had yeah, eight of the funniest looking little short leg, <laughs> long <laughs> puppies Labrador. you've ever seen. <laughs> so I think we should say two dogs, except at times when puppies are born, and they need to wait till the puppies grow up and move away or given away. That's so good language. Do you? On so you have some language for so, that. So time? we need yeah. some yeah, some puppy done. language there. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you very much. Except when dogs have a <laughs> yeah, but that <laughs> means the puppies can't be five by the time they adopt them. Yeah, I've right, got right, good right. language that I've used before on uh, recently on one in Garfield County where it talked about litters and how long the litter can that, be. That's great way. <laughs> Thank you. I don't think we can ask for them to neuter their championship <laughs> hunting dog. So. You know, the funniest thing about the whole story was that people were really very willing to buy them for Christmas to have puppies under the Christmas trees because the spay and neuter programs have been so successful, it's actually very hard to find puppies for presents. Oh, and those were big, cute puppies. They were cute. Mm -hmm. Did any other member of the board want to add to those points? Um, if we decide to move this forward, those are those are issues I would like added to the resolution for clarity. Okay. Very good. George, did you have anything else? Mm, I don't think so. I, uh, I have one other question. Do we, on a general basis or normally, put in the name of the CPW employee in our resolution? 
I noticed we said CPW District Manager John Groves. <laughs> I, I always have. I, I don't know. know. <laughs> that, 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 I just got to thinking about that. So. Huh. Just CPW District just Manager. manager. I, I, I think it would be helpful, though, if somebody's looking back on this resolution 10 years back. ago and it's like, who made that recommendation? Okay. So I just wanted to make sure that John was okay with going down in perpetuity. Okay. There you go. Okay. We can leave John Groves' name in there. I would make a motion to approve uh, the resolution approving the Whitehawk Ranch LLC amendment to Board of County Commissioners, resolution 91-171. Administrative decision number 50-2009, 53-2014, and 12-2016 regarding the prohibition of dogs as amended by the board with the suggestions uh, that have been made at the table. Second. Okay, and this is not a public hearing, correct? No. Because it's just land use. So uh, any other comments or concerns or questions from the board? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion passes 5-0. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jonathan, we'll see you at our work session if and yeah. whenever we get it. <laughs> be Absolutely. Good. All right. We are finished, but I'm going to bring it back for open discussion. And I will start off with, we did have the housing appointment for the alternate. I think we can, if we want to wait to find out what the city did, everybody has the opportunity. I know Jeanette brought the resume, but we probably need copies or somehow get it to the board members. We can uh, make that determination in our next work session, which will be the 12th. February, no. 13th. The th oh, yeah, because of the retreat. The 13th of February. Is that right? So if the board's comfortable with waiting until then for this appointment, then we'll get that information back from the from staff. Okay. Any other open discussion? Looking at you guys. No from the board? All right, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Thank you. Very good. I will make a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. And we have a motion in two seconds. So all those in favor, <laughs> please signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you very much. You didn't ask if anyone was opposed.